Good morning, Trinity. Welcome to worship this morning to our online guests as well as our in-person attendees. I, uh, I'm wearing a mask today simply because I've had a sore throat all week. I, I tested for COVID this week and the test came back negative. So joy to the world, I do not have COVID, um, but I've got something and I, I don't wanna share it with you. I have other things I'd like to share with you from here, uh, but the safest way for me to do that today is to wear a mask. So please do not interpret this as Trinity going back to masks. I have told you before, if it comes to that, and I hope it doesn't, I will go kicking and screaming. Um, my, I have no interest or intention of going back to masks, but it's individual choice, and, and I'm choosing to wear a mask because today, at least, I feel it would be safer for all of us here. And I hope that if anybody else feels sick, that you'll either not come or that you will uh, wear a mask just to help other people feel, uh, well, not just so that we can feel safe, but so we can be safe and so that we can all do our part. Um, so that, that explains the mask today. I will try to enunciate clearly because I know sometimes people feel they can't hear as well without the mask. I, I hope that this will clear up and next week we'll be back to uh, the, seeing my smiling face and my pearly yellows, I mean my pearly whites. Uh, in the meantime, there are a couple of announcements I would like to share with you. We have some things coming up here at Trinity that are, are not, on your, not on your agenda yet, but I hope you will put them there. First of all, we are having our trunk and treat on October 16th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that is a fun day for the people of Trinity as well as the kids. We will have, uh, we, we need volunteers to decorate your trunks. If the weather is nice enough, we're going to gather in our parking lot down below and kind of form a U-shaped semicircle with our trunks open and decorated with candy. And we need people to volunteer to come on that day and decorate your trunk or dress up in a costume and hand out candy to kids. So that's one area that we need volunteers. The second area we need volunteers is we need people to bring candy. So over the next couple of weeks prior to the 16th, uh, we would ask that if you would like to donate some candy to Trinity for use in Trunk or Treat, please do so. Eileen has already set up a box out front of her office where you can drop off donations. And then we also need you to spread the word, invite your children to come, invite kids from the community to come and enjoy a time of uh, Trunk or Treat. We do a little uh, walk through parade and we give kids candy and we invite people to church. So it's a nice fun day and we, we look forward to that on October 16th. The second day I'd like you to put on your calendar is not for everyone, but for people that are oh, probably my age or somewhere approaching uh, in that. We're having a financial seminar as we, our finance committee likes to sponsor one of these every year on some topic that we think will be of interest and help to people uh, in, in certain areas of the church. And this year we're having someone come in and speak about Social Security and Medicare. So if that is a topic that is of interest to you and you would like to, to learn about some of the new laws and some of the new things related to Social Security and Medicare, I invite you to come on Sunday, October 24th. It'll be after our 11 o'clock service. So 12.15, we'll have a light luncheon and then the presentation will start at 12.45 uh, for about 45 minutes or so, as well as a time of Q&A. We have the assistant HR director from Cal U, who uh, John Lockhart has highly recommended to us, and she will be coming to share some thoughts with us related to those topics. So there will be a sign-up sheet out in the Welcome Center, and we invite you to sign up if that's something that you think would benefit you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Jamie Schroeder, our worship leader. Good morning. Some of you might be wondering why you keep seeing me up here. It's because we need additional worship leaders, please. I'm happy to be here and I'm very happy to lead worship. At the same time, we are looking for additional people to share the joy of being a worship leader. It doesn't take a lot of time and it just does take showing up once a month or so. So please, if you have any interest, if you'd be comfortable to change places with me and be up here greeting people and sharing a moment of worship, please let me know or let Mary Agnew or Pastor Jeff know. We would welcome it. 
Another announcement is the next prayer walk will take place this coming Saturday morning at 8.30 at Peters Lake. We've realized that the evening prayer walks weren't going to work any longer because it's getting dark earlier. And finally, I was asked to remind people that rehearsals are downstairs for the Kingdom Kids. This, this morning downstairs, thanks Amy. Let us pray. We come together in the presence of a God whose love and support are great. He understands that it's sometimes hard for us to see his grace and blessings in our lives, but he remains with us to guide and strengthen us. Dear Lord, know that we strive to follow your plan for us and carry your goodness in our hearts and in our actions. Amen. And, yes. and would the uh, musicians come up, please? Thank you. Please stand and join us in song. Saved inside your presence, you hold back the enemy. 
Amen. Please be seated. Uh, before the children come up, let me uh, once again make my announcement. You will be on camera, so please make sure that you have signed a waiver uh, saying that you're okay with that before you send your kids up. And also, I, I was asked by our Sunday school directors to make an announcement about the masks. You will see me, even when I feel healthy, wear a mask now in front of the children, uh, because now that we've got Sunday school going again, uh, we do ask people to wear masks around children because they're unvaccinated for the most part. Um, so children especially, if you, as you go downstairs, if you need a mask, we have them for you down there. And just wanted you to know that we have child-sized masks as well. Uh, at this time, would the children please come forward for our children's message. You look like you want to try it. 
<laughs> Put this on your finger. Have it go on the palm of your hand. The palm of your hand. Be kind to him. He's going to zap you in a moment. So put it on so that you're, okay. Put it on like a ring. Hold it like that. And now shake her hand. Sweet. <laughs> See that? It's a lot of fun. I use this regularly with my grandson Elias. I've used it with Jack too, but he doesn't appreciate it as much. <laughs> But Elias does, and so when, whenever I see Elias, I'll line this thing up beforehand, and, and Elias has one now too. And he'll come to me, and I want to give you a little hint, all right? If Elias ever comes up to me, and I notice a little ring on his finger like that, so I taught him how to hide it, okay? And he comes up to me with these words. He says, let's have a hug. <laughs> and whenever he says, let's have a hug, and he gets this big smile on his face, I know I'm about to get... I'm about to get zapped. That's his cue. Let's have a hug. Those words tell me something is going to happen. And I want to talk to you about communion today because words are a part of our communion. When I say certain words, you're going to know something's going to happen because I say very similar words every time I share Holy Communion. So words are one part of the communion ritual that tell us something's going to happen. Now, there's another part of it as well. And that other part involves ritual, like me wearing a robe. Uh, a lot of people have rituals around games like, or days like today, because what happens at 425 today? Does anybody know? The Pittsburgh Steelers will play against the Green Bay Packers. And if you look out there, uh, well, they're, they're all outside now in the back, but our ushers are all wearing black and gold today. See through the window there. Danny's got black and gold, and Brian's got black and gold, and I see Julie with black and gold. Uh, it, it's a it's a ritual that we wear our team colors. And let me tell you a secret, all right? Some people, some fans, think that if they don't do their ritual right, their team will lose that day. We call that a superstition. I mean, I have a tie. I have a Steelers tie that I wear every time the Steelers play the Browns. And almost every time it works, they win. Didn't work last time, twice. It was frustrating. <laughs> and Bob Wilde told me, you gotta burn that tie. Again. But we believe that somehow those rituals will make something happen. Now, communion's different. We don't believe in a superstition with communion, but we do believe in ritual. And so when we have that ritual and I take the bread and I break it, and I say, This is the body of Christ given for you. And when I take that cup and I hold it up and say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you, those words and those actions together form a ritual or a ceremony that invites us to remember Jesus and to remember the story of what Jesus did on the cross for us when he gave his life so that we could have a better life. And I want you to remember that when you think about communion, and you sometimes wonder, what's this all about? Why do we have this little cup and that little wafer and bread and juice? Why do we do that? It's part of a ritual. The words and the actions come together to create a memory of something that connects us to Jesus. And we believe that that is important and worth continuing. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the rituals and ceremonies that we do that help us to remember you. We pray that communion would be something special that would connect us to you and to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, no, you cannot borrow this, but you can get your own at, I think, Five Below or Amazon. Hand buzzer. It's fun. And everybody, please take one of those with you. You're welcome to the Sour Patch Zombie version. They're all sitting by me. Check it out the front. All right, very good. And you can go down to your Sunday school class if that's all right with your parents. And we'll see you again at the end of the service. Thanks for coming today.
so this. Hmm. I'm sorry that this mic isn't working. You know, I, I hate to be bound to a pulpit, but uh, I might have to do that now today just to make sure everybody can hear me. For our time of uh, pastoral prayer, uh, again, knowing that you're online right now, does anyone have any praises or prayers that you would like to share with us today? All right, either the online scares you or life is good this week. Uh, either way, we'll take it. And I know there are some prayers out there um, that we are praying for. And, and please know that uh, we hear and our prayer chain is active and responding to the requests that you send in. Let's go to God in prayer. If there is a praise in your heart today, something that you didn't say out loud, but in the silence of your heart, you want to lift up a praise to the Lord. Let's have a moment of silence. Let's lift up our praises before Jesus. Is there something you're struggling with this week? Something that you'd like to lay before the feet of the Lord as a prayer, as a request? A prayer for yourself or for someone else? Whatever it is you're struggling with, we believe the Lord hears us when we pray. And I invite you in this moment of silence to lift up your prayers before the Lord. And let's have a moment of silence now to be still and to listen for God's voice. Almighty God, we come before you today we lift up to you the praises, the prayers, and we ask that you would hear us. We ask that you would be glorified by our praises and that we would be changed as we pause for a moment to reflect on your goodness and to respond in gratitude by saying thank you. Lord, we also pray that you would hear our prayers that we lift up and there again, that you would not only hear us and respond, but that we too might be changed by our prayers. And there are times where we feel our prayers are answered, and in that we rejoice. There are also times where we pray and nothing seems to happen, or what happens is not what we prayed for, and we wrestle to understand. Lord, once again, may we pray with faith and may we realize that when prayer doesn't change an outcome, may prayer change us, may prayer change our perspective, may prayer lead us to a deeper faith and a greater trust in you. Lord, we pray today on this World Communion Sunday as we gather together here at Trinity United Methodist Church in connection with brothers and sisters all around the world. We give you thanks that we are a part of something much bigger than ourselves. Lord, as we reflect on that, may you speak to our spirits here today. As individuals, you hear our individual prayers and praises. And as a group, as a community, you hear and you respond and you Connect us, not only with you, but with each other. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. 
All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus, as you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. And I invite you to open your Bibles and turn there and follow along with me as we read Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth about communion. And Paul, if you read what precedes this, Paul is not happy with the church at Corinth. They're not doing this right. They're getting sidelined on other issues. They are getting, allowing things to divide them rather than to unite them. And they are missing the point of communion. And so Paul reminds them of the instructions about communion with these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A person ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on themselves. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for these words. And we pray that you would use them to help us examine ourselves, to help us to understand communion, and to help us to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to make a confession to you. There are times where even pastors don't know what we're talking about. Uh, actually, that happens more frequently than I would like to admit. So I used to serve on the Board of Ordained Ministry for our conference, and we would often ask people about communion. And they would share their stories, people that were coming up through the process to become pastors. And sometimes I would really tune in because communion is supposed to be this special experience. It's supposed to be this, this institution, this ritual, this means of grace, this sacrament. A sacred experience. And sometimes it becomes routine to me. I would guess if you're being honest, there are times where it becomes routine to you as well. We do it the first Sunday of every month. Uh, we get our little snack and, and we try to connect with Jesus through it. We try to, to fully grasp what's going on here. But sometimes it goes a little over our heads or we're worried about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen later today. And so we miss the meaning of communion. And so when I was on the Board of Ordained Ministry, I listened closely to people's stories and their understandings of communion because even though I have an idea what communion means and how it impacts me, I feel like sometimes it's lacking. I wish that, that I could experience it more fully. And so I was always ready to listen to others and to hear their perspectives. A few years ago, I was serving at a different church and a uh, family came and started attending the church who had formerly been Catholics. And they had two girls, six and eight years old, and those girls had not yet had their first Holy Communion, which in the Catholic Church is a really big deal. In the Methodist Church, we still believe communion is a big deal, but we believe all of them are a big deal, not just your first one. And so we don't have the same emphasis on that first Holy Communion 
as they do in the Catholic Church. And this father came to me and said, would you explain communion to my daughters so that they can understand it? Because we're not going through the, all the catechisms and all the other stuff the Catholic Church normally does anymore. I thought, boy, how am I going to explain this to a six-year-old and an eight-year-old? Uh, it was not something. So I said, give me some time. I'll be happy to talk with them next week. And uh, so I, I did. I did uh, come up with some things. And I shared with them uh, some of what I'm going to share with you today. Some of what you heard in my children's message this morning. I think sometimes the best way to understand something is not to hear theologians talk about it. Is not to hear up-and-coming pastors describe it in their understanding. I think sometimes the best way to understand something is to try to see it from the perspective of a six-year-old or an eight-year-old and try to wrap your mind around how, how would you explain it to them. And so I'm going to try to do that today and not trying to treat you like six and eight-year-olds, but again, if you're anything like me, there are times where our experience of communion, we feel, is not the same experience that, that we see others or hear others talk about. So what does it mean? How do we figure it out? And why did Paul instruct us about it? Why did Jesus institute it in the first place? All of these different things. So two primary things we'll look at today. First of all, what communion is. And second of all, what communion does. So what, what is communion? At its heart, communion is the Christian ceremony commemorating the Last Supper in which bread and wine are consecrated and consumed. Uh, it's referred to as the Last Supper, it's referred to as the Lord's Supper, it's referred to as Holy Communion, the Eucharist, a variety of different things. Uh, Eucharist is a Greek word which means to be thankful or to show favor. And as we think about it, it's, it's a response of our gratitude to Jesus for what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we'll look at that. But at its heart, what communion is, is this Christian ceremony, it's a ritual in some sense. It's a ritual, a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. That's the definition of a ritual. And we do that. I try to follow that and see as much as I can if I can connect with what's been done in the past in order that we can experience it in the present and so that we can continue this into our future. So in, at its heart, that's what communion is. It's this ceremony, it's this ritual that commemorates what Jesus did for us on the cross and the hope that we have beyond the cross because of the resurrection. Let's take a look at what communion does. And here's where I've got some stories for you. Uh, first of all, communion, this is the key theme for the day. Communion connects us to Christ and to community. Ultimately, I think that's what communion does. It, it's a way of connecting us to Christ and to community. Uh, it's a means of grace. Let's, let's see how communion connects, all right? Communion connects. It's what's known as a means of grace through which God's grace flows to God's children. And that image that you see there of a dying plant and a water bottle, that image that you saw there. There we go. That image that you see there of a dying plant right next to a water bottle. You know what that plant needs? That, that plant needs water. The water is right there. But the plant is still dying. I think sometimes an image can connect with us in a powerful way. And when I think about us as believers, there are times where we feel like that dead plant. There are times where we feel a spiritual dryness, a spiritual emptiness. And what we need is the water. What we need is a channel through which God's grace can flow to us. And communion is a reminder that it's right here. It's right beside us, but we've got to grasp it. We've got to take advantage of it. We've got to take it. And so that's why we gather once a month regularly in order to receive this means of grace, in order to have God's grace flow into us, nourishing our very souls and spirits, much like water will nourish a plant. Communion is a way that connects us with that grace of God, a way that connects us to this means of grace, this channel through which God's grace flows to God's children. 
In simple terms, that is one aspect of what communion does. But there's a second connection that is made. Communion not only connects us to God's grace and connects us in general, communion connects us to Christ. Communion connects us to Christ. Verses 24 through 26, Jesus says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is what? It's for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many. I'm adding here. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It connects us to Christ in a powerful way. Let me say something about that connection. If you watch my Facebook videos as previews of this, you heard me talk about my grandfather and how my grandpa, I have very few memories of my grandpa Bloom. He died when I was about five years old and so I don't remember him well. You'll hear me talk about my grandma Bloom much more often. Grandma bought me this stole and so I often wear this stole as a reminder of grandma. I have a lot of memories of grandma, few of grandpa, but one of the memories is sitting at the kitchen counter in their kitchen in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and Grandpa teaching me how to properly dunk a donut. And I thought I liked donuts. Perhaps a demonstration is in order. I was going to do this on a flat table because, uh, you know, over there, but now with my mic not working, I guess I'll do it here. So. He always, I don't, I don't say always, I don't remember this happening once, but it was a very special memory that I had. Uh, Yetis were not invented yet, so I'm going to use a coffee cup because that's what he had. And a coffee cup with a little cream in it. And I don't remember if it was a plane. This will be complicated, won't it? Allow me uh, this. I don't remember if it was a plain or a powdered sugar donut, but he took a donut and he said, first you have to break it in half. And he gave half of it to me and he kept the other half for himself. And I was only five. I didn't drink coffee. But he let me take it and he said, and then you dip it. You dunk it into the coffee just a little bit, enough for a bite-sized piece. And then you take a bite of the donut saturated with the coffee. And oh, it's really good. Oh, boy. <laughs> there it is. I could eat the whole rest of this donut right now, but I won't because I, I'm going to eat another donut to show you another ritual that I do. Uh, I don't usually get to drink coffee while I preach, so I'm going to take advantage of this moment. <laughs> Grandpa taught me how to dunk a donut in the coffee, and now whenever I have coffee, and if I, I don't, I'm not really a dunker, but occasionally I do, and when I do, who do you think I think of? Absolutely, I think of Grandpa Bloom. And, and it's one of the very few memories that I have, but something about that food, that drink, that act connects me with that memory and with that person. Do you see the parallels here? Dropped it again. That would have been so powerful. Do you see the parallels here? Instead, I drop it on the floor. And anyway, <laughs> the parallels though, the parallels. This is what I want to try to explain to you as I explain it to children. Communion connects us to a special memory of Jesus. Uh, let's go back to the donuts, though. I'm going to have another one. Because I'm not as much of a dunker today, but I taught my grandson Elias how to properly eat a donut. Because, again, Jack is more into ice cream. I'm more into donuts. So Elias likes donuts with me. And I said, Elias, there's a way to eat a donut that's better than what you might understand. And so we both like frosted donuts, chocolate, maple, either one. And I said, there's a better way to eat this. Most people just take it and they take a bite. But I tell you what, you're missing out on the experience when you do that. Because what's the best part of a chocolate donut? The chocolate, right? The frosting. And where are your taste buds? Are they on the roof of your mouth or are they on your tongue? Here it is, folks. That's it. Flip that donut upside down. Take a bite with that frosting right on your tongue? Oh my. It's such a more full experience. It's so much better. 
when you eat that donut the right way. Flip it upside down. It tastes better. It is better. That's the whole point of the frosting, right? So we want to enhance that experience. So Elias and I, whenever he eats a donut now, I love it when I see him do that. He'll take it and he'll smile at me and he'll flip that baby upside down and take a bite. And so that's now a ritual that I can share with Elias. And, and once again, let's try this again, all right? So the food, the drink, it, it connects. It connects us with each other. And I hope that one day, uh, uh oh boy, Elias turns five this year. I hope that I live a lot longer than my grandpa Bloom did. I hope that Elias and I have a lot of memories to share together. But I know that one day, or I hope that one day, uh, I hope he outlives me by a long, 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 long time. And I hope that when he remembers me, when he has that donut and flips it upside down, I, I hope that maybe he'll teach his own kids or grandkids to do that because it, it's a legacy, it's a connection, something from the past that we experience in the present that we want to see continue into the future. Do you see the connections, folks? Do you see the connections, folks? A communion, it connects us to Christ. It connects us to each other. I've got to put those away or I'm going to want to eat the rest of them. <laughs> communion connects us in a special way. And so communion connects us to Christ. It connects us to Christ. It's this memory. Now, we weren't there at the cross, right? That happened 2,000 years ago. But we read the stories. We hear the stories proclaimed of of what Jesus did for us on the cross. All right, you can switch off the donut now. There we go. When Jesus broke that bread, when Jesus took that cup, we connect with Jesus in a powerful way in this act, in this ritual of Holy Communion. And, and it reminds us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Just like Jesus took that bread and, and gave it to his disciples. In a similar way that symbolizes Jesus giving himself, his very self, his very life for us on the cross. Paul makes the point here, we should examine ourselves before we take the bread and drink the cup. And I give you the opportunity to do that every time we gather for Holy Communion, or at least I try to. I say we need to have a moment of silent confession. We need to examine ourselves. Why do I do that? Why do we do that as a people? It's because we're looking for peace with God. We want our relationship with God to be right. And we can get so caught up in this world and in the busyness of life or in the anxieties of life or in the troubles of life that we, we miss out on that connection and we, we lose sight of how important it is that, that our hearts are at peace with Jesus. And so communion is that opportunity for us to come back and to recenter and to ask ourselves the question, am I at peace with God right now? Is my heart right with my Creator? Is my heart right with my Savior? Is my heart right with my brother and my sister? With people? Is your heart right this morning? Are you at peace with God? Are you searching for a closer relationship with God? We believe that remembering what Christ did on the cross and embracing, accepting the forgiveness that Jesus poured out on the cross for us, that when we go and confess our sins, when we allow our guard to drop a little bit and to acknowledge that we've screwed up, that we're sinners in need of a Savior, and that our life is not right, and there's nothing we can do to fix it, but Jesus did and Jesus can by what he did on the cross for us. And we engage with that at communion. And we accept that. And we receive Jesus in a special way. And we remember, if we've already received Christ, we remember when that happened. And we remember that, that that happens. If you haven't yet received Christ, communion is a time for you to do that. It's a time for you to confess your sins, to examine your hearts, and to say yes to Jesus and to the work that he did on the cross for you. Communion connects us to Christ. Communion connects us in general. Communion also connects us to Christ and to community. What you'll notice in this passage, if, you, if you're a student of Greek or if you read a book from someone who's a student of Greek, because I'm not a student of Greek, 
Uh, but it's pointed out to me that every time Jesus or Paul uses the word you in this passage, it's plural, not singular. It's plural. Why? Because Jesus didn't just do this for you and you and you and you. Jesus did this for you. Jesus did this for all of us. It's a community practice. It's a community celebration. It's a community, community event. And when we share in Holy Communion, we find this connection beyond ourselves to, all the way back to Jesus and the disciples and that, that first last supper that Jesus had with them. We remember that in a special way. Because of these stories, because of communion, we connect with that. We also connect beyond that, though. Let me share a story with you about this next picture. This is a photograph of the new room in Bristol, England. I was there in, I believe that was 2015, maybe 2016. And that's Bishop Bickerton behind me. His hair was white at the time. Now my hair is white. So that had to be a few years ago. But that table, which you can't see because there are people surrounding it, the new room is almost 300 years old. I forget exactly how many years, plus 250 plus. But they still call it the new room. And the table where they are serving communion, it was a meeting place for Methodists back in John Wesley's day. And in many ways, it looks the same as it did in John Wesley's day, which was in the 1700s in England. And the table that you can't see, but that I'm standing behind, is the same table that John Wesley served communion from in the new room 250 plus years ago. And so I had gone on that trip several times and, and the bishop would often ask somebody from the trip to go and serve communion with him. And I think this was my last trip. And I went to the bishop and I said, Bishop, I've watched this every year. I would love if I could be the one to serve communion this time. And so he invited me to come and do so. And I did that because communion, in a sense, it connected me with that table in that place from the past. It connected me with saints from the past, with believers from the past. And I believe that communion today still does that. By these words of ritual, by this act of ritual, it connects us not just with Jesus and the disciples and the first last supper, it connects us with believers throughout history. In a special way, I felt like, holy cow, I'm serving communion from the same table that John Wesley, the one who we call the father or founder of the United Methodist Church. I connected with him there. And now when I share communion with you each week, you've got a connection with John Wesley. You've got a connection with Jesus. Not because of me. Because of Jesus. Because of what Holy Communion does for us. It connects us to Christ. It connects us to our community. It connects us to Jesus. It connects us to believers throughout history. It connects us to believers who are right here today. When you share in Holy Communion together, you share in Holy Communion with each other. You're sitting beside people, some who you know, some who you don't know, some who you know well, some who you kind of know a little bit, some who are Republican, some who are Democrat, some who have views and perspectives that are widely, vastly different from yours. But we connect at the table of Christ, recognizing that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And that in this time of Holy Communion, we are invited to put aside our identities, to put aside our circumstances, to put aside our titles, our classes, our wallets, or whatever it is that we think makes us us. And instead, we come as followers of Jesus. No better, no worse, no different than the person sitting beside you, from the person sitting on the other side of the uh, church from you, from me, from wherever. We come and we are connected with each other in a very powerful way. Communion does that. It connects us to Christ and to community. And today it connects us with believers all around the world. It's World Communion Sunday. Like I said to the kids, it's something special. If you see Pastor Jeff wearing a robe. In 1933, not only were the Pittsburgh Steelers founded as the greatest NFL dynasty and team in, in NFL history. From Pittsburgh, of course, I say that. 
But in 1933, here in Pittsburgh, in Shadyside, at the Presbyterian Church, the pastor of that church decided to begin what became known as World Communion Sunday, to celebrate communion not just among the people in his own church, but to choose a day where it would spread out to other churches, and not just Presbyterians, but people of all Christian denominations and faiths. And so today when we share in Holy Communion, I want you to know that there are other churches all around the globe who are taking a piece of bread, who are taking a, a bit of juice or wine, and who are taking it together. And they're taking it with you. And it's connecting them to Jesus. It's connecting them to believers of the past. It's connecting them to the people that they're with right now. And it's connecting them to you, even though you don't see them right now. But ultimately, communion connects. It connects us to Jesus in a very powerful way. Uh, let me close by sharing with you what I ended up saying to Emma and Anna as I explained to them Holy Communion the best way that I could. Uh, these, this idea, communion connects us to Christ and community, I encapsulated it in the idea of the best Thanksgiving dinner that they could imagine. Food everywhere, people that mattered all around the table. And when we gather for Thanksgiving, it's for many, it's a special occasion. I realize it's not the same for everyone. Your experience is different than mine, but when you think of uh, the best or the, the most wonderful Thanksgiving meal you can experience with family all gathered around and everything else, and we think about the people at the table, some who we like, some who we don't like, some relatives we know, some that we don't know, some that we see regularly, some that we only see at this gathering, some that we are glad to see, some we're not so glad to see. And some of the seats are empty because people that were here before are no longer with us. Or maybe somebody else is sitting in their seat because someone got a new boyfriend or someone got a new girlfriend or got married or had a child. And, and the, the faces around the table, although they stay for the most part the same, they also change a little bit. But we come together for Thanksgiving as a family and we put aside our differences, and we come together because there's something that unites us. It's family. And when we share in Holy Communion, we are the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all children of God, and we come in need of the grace that we find at the table of Holy Communion. And today, I invite all of you to that table. I invite all of you to share in Holy Communion and to see how that can connect us to Christ and to community. May it be so. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for communion. We give you thanks for these words that remind us of the importance of communion. And Lord, we pray that in it we would find you, that we would be connected to these memories, these words, these rituals in a way that gives us a powerful connection to our past, to our present, and to our future, all in the name of Christ, as we connect with you and our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we will share today in Holy Communion on this World Communion Sunday. So I invite everyone to take a deep breath. I hope that that message uh, gave you some perspectives on communion that will make it a little bit more real to you, that will make it a little bit more meaningful to you, but ultimately that will connect you with Jesus because that is what communion at its heart is supposed to do. And we begin that with this time of examination, of silent confession. So let's pause for a moment of silence, set our hearts right with our Lord and with each other. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. And a word to our online audience today. Um, we can't supply you in some miraculous way with 
grape juice and with bread. Um, and I'm not allowed to say that you can take Holy Communion just by going to your fridge. It's not quite the same as being here because of what we talked about with that community aspect. Um, and yet, uh, you can have a love feast, is the word that we would apply to you at home. So if you have bread and juice of some sort and would like to partake uh, as a love feast, we welcome you to do that and to follow along as we continue our service of Holy Communion today. making Eileen nervous by balancing this on the edge like that. I realize that. I'll be very careful. On the night that he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And then in the same way, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this to remember me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember you today and we remember what you did on the cross for us. Lord, as we confess our sins and as we try to reflect on what happened on the cross. We ask today that you would pour out your spirit upon these gifts of bread and juice and upon all of us who are gathered here today. Make these elements be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. Together, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in community all around the world as we come together as sinners in need of a Savior, to share in this time of Holy Communion, seeking the spiritual nourishment that only you can supply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to take that cup and to uh, remove the top thin layer, which exposes the wafer. And recognize that even in this little disposable wafer, we experience the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. And then take the cup and open it up. Again, you don't have to peel it off all the way, but enough so that you can get to the juice. And recognize that in this, we see the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it and remember him. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for Holy Communion. Thank you, Lord, for the nourishment that gives life to our souls. Even as food nourishes and strengthens the body, so we believe that Holy Communion nourishes and strengthens our spirits. May we take you in, that we might also take you out into the world around us. Lord, we give you thanks for what you've done on the cross. We give you thanks for giving us this ceremony by which we might remember that. And we give you thanks for the future hope that we all have in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. And as I always end, I end our service today by saying, by eating this bread and drinking this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus, amen. At this time, uh, for our offering and ministry moments, I want to just talk with you briefly about Trunk or Treat that I mentioned coming up on October 16th. This is short notice, and so 
I'm asking you to, in the next two weeks, pull this together. And I believe that we can do it. And I, I highlight it today as part of our ministry moment because this is about doing something for our community. This is about doing something for our kids. Uh, we send out flyers to every child that attends Trinity Weekday School. Uh, we reach out to, to kids in our own community. And it's a way to try and, and share with them about something that's going on here at Trinity Church that they can be a part of with the hopes that it will then connect them with the church and what we do in a spiritual sense as well. Uh, so you are invited to be a part of that, as I said, either by coming on the 16th and decorating your trunks, by bringing candy and donating it, or by spreading the word and inviting people to come and experience that day. Uh, and it's just, it's another way for you to give. It's another way for you to give to the church. It's another way to, for you to give to community, to give to kids. And as we do that, even through a Halloween party or a fall party or whatever you want to call it, even through that, we can have an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. And if you'd like to give to the church and to our ministries in other ways, just through the general fund, there's a plate at the back of the church you're welcome to use. Uh, you can sign up online and do e-giving, or you can send something into the church office throughout the week, and we'll make sure that that gift goes to where you're wanting it to go. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the ministries that Trinity has. Lord, we thank you even for Trunk or Treat and the opportunity to reach the kids in our community. And we pray that you would use events like this to draw people to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I'd like to invite our musicians forward for our closing song. One, sorry, Agnes Day for our, for our anthem.
Amen. What a beautiful song. Uh, before we close, I just want to tell you all what you've been smelling all service uh, out there in the Welcome Center. Uh, we shared last week that Tatiana Ritter is doing a fundraiser for the United Methodist Women, whereby she is offering four authentic Persian meals to the highest bidder. And so today is your first opportunity to bid. It will be done via a silent auction, which means there will be four papers out there, one with each meal on it, and you can sign up for any, of, any or all of the four. And then whoever has the highest bidder, I believe next week is when the auction's going to close. Uh, but today she's got something she prepared and she's got free samples. And that's what you're smelling out there. It smells wonderful. Um, so if you'd like to sign up for that fundraiser and, and get a, a home cooked meal, like one you've probably never had before, uh, today's the first day to do that. And if you'd like a free sample, even if you don't sign up, I'll bet you she'll give you one. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.